when the Bible tells us, as we have read uh, in, in Ecclesiastes 9, 10, the first part of the verse 10, that whatever we find our hands doing, we should do it with all our might. It's simply saying that you must recognize every opportunity for what it is, uh, an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody. And it is because when you do that, and God is at the center of it, then your impact can be felt. So I'm going to be speaking to you, not just from my life, or, or yes, uh, from the word of God, but also from this book, which uh, Mama uh, Rose kindly introduced. So if you don't have a copy of this book, I would also recommend it to you. Now, that might seem a bit weird because I am the author of the book, but honestly, it is a blessing and others uh, are speaking about it and I'll be making quotations uh, from it uh, for our benefit. So, uh, um, Colossians 3, the verse 23 says that whatever we do, we should work it at it with all our heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. So basically, when you are in the consulting room, when you are in the lecture theater, when you are on the street, in the shopping mall, wherever you find yourself, remember that there is a work that you are doing and that work should be done as unto the Lord. Now, why am I spending so much time to, to explain what uh, the work of your hand is? Because it's important that you understand your sphere of influence. If you do not understand that, then it would be difficult for you to maximize your opportunities to impact uh, the lives of others. Now, the... the last bit of our theme says that to possess the nations and the word possess means to occupy, to dominate or to control. I hope that is bringing it gradually into focus for us to occupy, to dominate, to control. So when you read uh, um, Isaiah 54, the verse two to three is talking about enlarging our tent. It means that acquire new territories make use of your opportunities, look out for other opportunities. And then it talks about letting the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. So in other words, do not be content with what you have achieved. You should always, always, always be seeking to improve yourself, be seeking to spread further and further. And that is to uh, basically carry the kingdom agenda, which is the mandate that you carry as a child of God into the rest of the world. And it says that do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. So for me, the way I interpret the strengthening of my stakes is that whatever it is that I'm doing, I must be excellent at it. So there may be a million and one doctors in the world. There may be a million and one musicians. There may be a million and one pharmacists or lawyers, whatever profession there is. But so long as I'm committed to that profession, uh, profession, I'm going to be excellent at it. And the only way we can be excellent at something is when we study to show ourselves approved as workmen who need not be ashamed so that we know our stuff. We gain the experience that is necessary for the practice of, of our career or our profession. And then we would then be able to uh, enlarge our territory, we would then be able to extend the, the curtains of our habitation. And when we've done that, the verse three says, then you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. So you would realize that these days in our world, even though a large number of people identify as Christians, not a lot of influence is coming from Christians. The world is very much dominated, controlled by the worldly. But as we have been given a mandate as a glorious church, revived to possess the nations, we need to look at the fact that we are meant to be the, the pace setters. We are meant to be the examples. We are meant to be the people that people look at and Emily, but to be able to do that, we must acquire a niche. We must be excellent at what we do. We must, you know, be willing to prospect for further dominance 
So we would never sort of become complacent and be, be happy with what we've been able to do so far. So for instance, my dream was to go to medical school. Now I'm in medical school in Ukraine and therefore I'm done. No, we would never be happy with that. We would prospect for more. And the reason why that is so, in addition to everything that I've said, is that we must be able to serve the purpose of God in our generation. That is what impact is about. I'll use this example. When uh, uh, you look at the moon, the moon, as we know, is a, a, a globe or, or, or an inert round object that is part of the universe that we see. It is, in, in effect, a satellite round the Earth and it has no inherent light of its own. But at night, during certain times, dependent on the position of the earth and the, the, the moon, its light can be seen. And there are times when its light is seen very brightly so that people can walk just mainly by moonlight in the absence of electricity. Why is that so? That is because the moon reflects the light of the sun. And the moon reflecting the light of the sun is sort of a, a, a bit like, you know, us positioning ourselves to be the vessels that reflect God's glory so that the world can see. The world cannot see God. We ourselves that believe in him and love him and serve him, we've not seen him with our eyes, but we know him and his spirit lives in us. And so when we position ourselves in such a way that he can work through us, then we reflect his glory so that others can see it. So when you look at the moon, it's only at any point in time, reflects about three to 12 percent of the sun's light. But can you imagine the difference in the radiance as the moon goes from reflecting three percent of the sun's light to reflecting 12 percent of the sun's light? When it does that, everybody can see. Everybody sort of looks at it in admiration and is drawn to its light. It's the same sort of uh, uh, aspiration that we should have in terms of how we relate to God, how we position ourselves, how we use what we have to hand to reflect the glory of God. As we do so, the light also shines on us. The focus also comes on us. So if you want to uh, 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 be, be noticed, if you want to be noted as impactful in your generation, then the first thing is to put the priority or the focus on God. You seeking to uh, reflect him and then the world will then notice you. And so Isaiah 64, one would say that the, the whole world will come to our light. How do the whole world come to our light? They come to our light when we are reflecting the light of God. So let's get down to business. All oh, that was preamble. Uh, <laughs> hallelujah. Let's get down to business. So as I said, what we would want to know is one, understanding our purpose. Now, how does that apply in my life? Um, I was, yeah, according to the story that my mom told me, I was four years old. When I sort of identified my purpose, when I said that I'm going to be a medic and set my heart and mind to pursue it. And from what she tells me, it, it was a very sort of a uh, uh, focused uh, way of looking at things. Not even once did I change my, my perspective on what I wanted to do. I said, I'm going to be a medic. And I went on and on. And anybody that would listen to me, that is what I would say. But at that time, and right up through to me growing up, going through secondary school, going into university, I was learning that, being a medic was not the be all and the end all of things. Being a medic was just a tool, a vehicle for me to be able to do what God actually wants me to do, which is to be a blessing unto people. And so when you, you come to uh, uh, how to be an impactful person in society, the first thing I believe is to be able to identify your purpose in life. It's not about just your career path, is about your purpose, understanding why you are here on earth. And so when you read 
uh, Genesis 1, the verse 28, it talks about God blessing Adam and Eve after he had uh, created them and telling them to be fruitful and to multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. That is something that has blown my mind as I keep on dwelling and reflecting on it and meditating on it. What does it mean to be fruitful? What does it mean to multiply? Does it mean to have children? Does it mean, you know, to build mansions? Does it mean to, to you know, uh, 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 acquire wealth? My understanding of this is that fulfill purpose and the fulfillment of purpose is what God originally created us to do. Replicas of himself, able to dominate our will, able to establish his will here on earth. And so then it comes to light that the, the career that I have is mainly for the fulfillment of God's will on this earth. The, the, the marriage that I go into is for the same purpose. The children that I have and the training of them is for the same purpose. So when you've identified that purpose, then you, you, you are linking it to the original reason why God created you, which was to be fruitful and to multiply. So to make like kind of yourself on earth. So basically, you are a child of God to make more children of God. But how do you make more children of God? I find that in my uh, capacity as a medic, when people come to my consulting room, it's much easier to communicate with them. They respect the fact that I'm a professional and I'm giving a professional opinion on something. And therefore, when I chip anything else in, they also listen with a respectful ear. So they might not lift up their hands and say, today I accept Jesus as uh, Lord and Savior, but I've sown the seed. And as far as I know, it is the Holy Spirit that convicts and brings on salvation. And therefore, as that seed gets watered, I am replicating myself. Secondly, I'm also replicating myself by the mentorship that I engage in. So this evening, I'm sat with you lovely ladies having a chat about how to be impactful. I'm hoping that at the end of it, someone would identify that, oh, being a medic is a great opportunity that God gave me. Being an accountant is a great opportunity. Being a lawyer, be, being, you know, a pharmacist, being a hairdresser. I know there ain't any hairdressers in our midst, but usually I like to break it down so that you realize that you don't need letters after your name. Oh, Grace, Asante Dria, MDCHB, and BSC Human Biology, and MRCOG before I can be of impact in my little niche, so long as I have identified and understood the reason why I'm here on earth, then I can make impact. The second thing uh, is that that uh, 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 ident identification of your purpose should be linked to your ability to understand why you are where you are in terms of the current generation that you are in, the location where you are so it's not a mistake that you are in ukraine when you read chapter four of uh the book can god interrupt your life on page 83 i talk about the fact that the individual who would fulfill their god-given mandate to be fruitful and to multiply and to have dominion to to reproduce after the god kind must first learn to ascertain the reason of their existence now so if we believe that we are alive just because we are then we are going to fail to, you know, be able to uh, uh, make impact. But if we understand that I'm not in Ukraine just for the sake of it, I'm not in Ukraine simply because my parents could pay the school fees. Why am I not in medical school in my country of origin? A lot of us are not of Ukrainian birth. If there's any among us that are of Ukrainian birth, probably the fewer number of people. But why am I not in medical school in Ghana? Why did God choose to locate me in Ukraine? Have you asked yourself that question? Because inherent in the answer to that question is your ability to understand that being there for a purpose, you must seek and link that with what you are currently doing. So you don't leave the many opportunities that you have out. Then when you've identified, so we've identified the purpose or the reason why we were created, which is that God expects us to be fruitful and to multiply, to make after the God kind here on earth. We are also seeking to understand why we are where we are at the moment we are. That is your location. 
on that same point, we are seeking to understand why we are in the generation that we are in. At the time that we are, why were you not born in the 1970s? Why were you not born in the, you know, 18, whatever it is, you know, 1822? Why is it that you were, I believe most of you are millennials. I think most of you are very, very young. Uh, uh, apart from myself and uh, uh, probably uh, Auntie Lizzie and uh, Mama Rose, um, most of you are millennials, I would presume. Correct me if I'm wrong. But why is it that God chose to put you in the generation that you are in? And so when, when you look at the, the uh, uh, fact that there is a reason why you are where you are for such a time as this, then you would understand that like Esther, you must get to because a nation's uh, 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 salvation and survival depends on you. Like, you know, Florence Nightingale, you must get to so that modern day nursing as we have it would, would be, you know, a thing that is established with your name or that you must get acting now. So uh, 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 one of the things that I can lay claim to, and it, it's, you know, something that is open and uh, can be uh, checked, is the fact that in the last four years that I've been in my district, the GCSEs and the A-level scores for the young ladies in this district has gone up. Why has it gone up? There's a reason why God has brought me into this district at the time that I'm here. And I think that one of the reasons is for me to encourage young ladies to know that you can do it. There's nothing that is a limitation to you other than yourself, because everything that you have pertaining to your ability to achieve that which God has given onto your hands is already deposited in you. So understand that you were created and placed in Ukraine for such a time as this. Maximize every opportunity in that lecture room. Maximize every encounter that you have. And I hope that you are learning something. The third thing I would like for you to understand is my a, a sense of why everything needs to point back to God. You see, there are people who are doing things based on their knowledge, their skill, their strength. There are people who are doing things. But unless God is at the center of it, the impact of what they do is limited. But when God is at the center of it, because he is the one that is empowering and he is the one that is producing the fruit, then there is a cascade effect. So it might just be one person that you happen to influence or impact for good. But that person is going to change location at some point. That person is going to come into contact with other people at some point. That person is going to then influence them. So Paul says that I sold Apollo waters, but the glory is for God or the increase is of God. So it does not matter whether you see what, you know, your, your hands have achieved right away. But what I can tell you is that when God is at the center of it all, when you are making him the priority, as in everything that I'm doing, I'm doing for the sake of the manifestation of God's glory, then he is going to make sure that there's impact out of it. So when I see a young lady and I'm speaking to them about what they can do with their lives, I'm not uh, 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 setting myself up as the be all and the know it all of things. But however, I am using it as an opportunity to stir up the giftings that are already in them. So what I have come to understand is, just as I explained with the moon and the sun and the uh, effect of the moon reflecting the sun's light, what I have come to understand is that a light that is yielded and available to God for his use is one that he showcases. So now I'm finding myself in places that, in my opinion, I have no qualification to be. Just this afternoon, I got a call and it's to do something for the church in Norway. This evening, I'm here talking to the ladies in Ukraine. Sometimes I get the opportunity to, you know, minister in the US, minister in Israel, minister in uh, the different districts in the UK. 
And as far as I'm concerned, I'm not, you know, the best at, you know, oratory or the most knowledgeable person. But one thing I do know is that the desire of my heart is that he should be glorified. And I would encourage you in your life to make God the center of it. Because as you do it, then he is going to make sure that the light that you seek to reflect, reflects also on you. So the spotlight is also on you. The fourth thing that I would like to say is that whatever you find your hands doing, please apply yourself diligently to the task. It is both a professional requirement and a, a requirement of integrity to do everything that you do excellently. For me, the, 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 the operational word in my life is excellent. So I, I, I tell myself that perfection is what I'm seeking. Excellence is tolerated. That means I'm setting the bar high for myself so that the least I can do at any time T is to show excellence. How do I show excellence? By making sure that I study for the things that I'm supposed to uh, 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 be either applying in my profession or be teaching on or in, in communicating to others. I study the subject matter. That is something that you need to do as well. So I would not expect the, the young Christian lady who is studying medicine in Ukraine to be at the bottom of the path when the exam results come. You have a, 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 an obligation to go and to yourself and to your parents to study the subject matter. Whether it's physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, whatever it is, you must be excellent at it. And, um, excuse me, and I will uh, uh, speak more on why you need to be excellent about it. If you're going to be taking seriously when you handle any subject matter, it's something that you need to know front to back. You cannot be aiming and eyeing on it. You, you, you must know the subject matter, whether it's in the application, in your consulting room, or it's in an explanation you are giving in, in your lecture room or any interaction at all. So when, when you, you have that opportunity, you be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who Bible will tell us in Daniel chapter one, the verse 17 to uh, 20, that when they were in Babylon and they were selected to be part of the people that were trained by the king, Bible says that in the verse 20, so the, the, the uh, bit of scripture that I'm interested in is 17 to 20, but my main focus is on the verse 20, uh, the last bit of it. And it says that of all the people that were, you know, uh, trained to attend the king, Daniel, Misha, Shadrach, and Abednego, these four were found in every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them to be 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. 10 times better, not twice, not three times, but 10 times better. That means they studied, they applied themselves to the task. They, they made sure that they knew their stuff. So I will say to you that when you, you are, you know, uh, given the opportunity for anything, it is your opportunity for impact. It is the time that you, so I don't take anything lightly. I don't, uh, 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 you know, do things by half. I compel myself to, to apply myself to every task. So, I'm supposed to be here talking to you about my life and uh, how I'm using my skill as a medic, you know, to, to uh, 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 impact or uh, uh, influence ministry in terms of being a pastor's wife, how I'm doing it as a mother, how I'm doing it as, as you know, a, 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 a wife in general. And how I've managed to find time to write a book. And I'm telling you that whatever it is that you find your hands doing, apply yourself to it. And that is because that is exactly what I do. I've not just come to speak to you about my life. I've also come to speak to you about what God says concerning things. Ten times better. 
Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 10 times better in wisdom, in every knowledge that they were tested on. You and I owe it to God. So if you won't do it for yourself, do it for God. If you won't do it for your parents, do it for, your, uh, for God. Apply yourself diligently. You see that when you apply yourself diligently, you research your subject matter. You, you make sure that the lecture notes are read. You make sure that any textbook you know that you need to read to beef up your knowledge is done. You are then going to have such a mastery of what it is that you are you know, engaged in that you are not just going to pass your exams. You're going to excel at it. And the, the reason why you must excel at it is not just so you can get through medical school with flying colors, but so God will be glorified because he is not glorified when we bump and, and, and we flump at our exams. He's not glorified. And so for me, the application of God's principle in striving to be 10 times better at anything I find my hands doing means that I need to study to show myself as a workman approved. Apply yourself to the task. Is it opening prayer that you've been given to do? Please don't just take it as, oh, it's just opening prayer. I take it as, oh, I've been given the serious business of setting the mood for our service today. So if I need to pray into it, I will. If I need to study God's word so that I would have leading as to what prayer topics to, you know, introduce during the opening prayer, I will. Whatever it takes, I must make sure that I let God's light shine by the application of myself to the task. And on this point, I want to say that every opportunity that you are given within the church structure is your opportunity to learn. I'll tell you a story. I, I am very heavily into medical education, but I never ever thought, and I mean community medical education, I'm not a lecturer in a university. I mean community medical education or health education. I never thought that that was something that I could do. But I remember when I was in Ghana, I was fresh out of medical school. I was a house officer at Konfanochi Teaching Hospital, which is a teaching hospital in Kumasi, in Ghana, where I lived, I remember being invited by my boss to take a step to go and speak to a group of young virgins. That is a, a very, very lovely experience that I had. A group of young virgins who have come together to form a, a, an association and they wanted to know a little bit about, you know, the impact of sexual promiscuity on, on their health, talk a little bit about menstrual irregularities and so on and so forth. And when I availed myself of that opportunity and I prepared and I went to go and teach on it, I realized that, oh, actually, by God's grace, I'm able to explain a few things so that people can understand. And that is how it started. So since then, every opportunity that I've been given, I have availed myself of it. Sometimes it means that I need to restructure my uh, schedule in order to be able to accept it. Sometimes I have to say no if it's not possible to do. But the take-home message that I'm trying to uh, uh, relay from sharing this is that when you are given the opportunity to do anything, use it as an opportunity, one, to let God's light reflect through you. And two, to build yourself up because you never know where God is going to take you, whether he's going to put you in certain managerial positions or supervisory positions where you have to teach others, where you have to supervise others, where you have to lead others. So every opportunity that you are given, don't say, oh, these church people, they're being a bit of, you know, a new science and I've got to study. A university education means being educated universally. That means picking up life skills, picking up, you know, relational skills, picking up educational material or, you know, things that would inform your career. So apply yourself. And I want to encourage you that when you come and you are equipped and you are enhanced, you are built up in the body of Christ, please go and apply it in your sphere of influence. So the opportunities that you have had, the things that you have learned, apply it because that is what I do on a daily basis. So when I operate, I operate from the viewpoint that, oh, actually, this is my opportunity to let God shine through. I'm applying myself. I'm making sure I'm updating my surgical skills and I'm making sure that 
when my patients leave, they are well, that my complication rates are low and that people are grateful that they had that encounter with me. They are grateful that it was I that looked after them and not another doctor. So if you are given any opportunity, please apply yourself diligently. Excellence should be the bar that we set for ourselves because we know from God's word, everything that pertains unto life and godliness, we have been given. The last thing that I would like to speak to you uh, about is that you have been empowered for your assignment in life. We read about it and we knew that all things pertaining unto life and unto godliness has been given unto us. Every skill we need, everything that we need to be the people that God called us to be, to influence lives, whether it be by the laying on of hand, because I don't just, you know, uh, uh, um, give medical interventions. Sometimes I ask my patients uh, 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 permission to say a word of prayer with them. And the reason why I do that is you and I both know that medical science and, and you know, uh, pharmaceutical science, uh, uh, financial uh, uh, knowledge, whatever we find ourselves, uh, law knowledge, uh, 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 whatever area of uh, uh, skill or, or education that we are in has not got all the answers. And so there are times when people are broken and they come into contact with me and it's my opportunity to say a word of prayer and to lift them up. And that is possible because there is something that is deposited in me because the Holy Spirit lives in me. The same Holy Spirit that lives in you, the same Holy Spirit that was used to seal you the very day that you came to Christ. So you are not an ordinary young lady. You are a person empowered by God to do exactly what he has entrusted to your hands to do. You have been empowered for the task ahead. And it is my prayer that you would realize that he says in his word in Acts 1 8 that when you have received the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power so that you can be his witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Where is your Judea? Where is your Jerusalem? Where is your Samaria? It is your sphere of influence, and that Holy Spirit is in you. So make use of the Holy Spirit and let that which is in you, the unction that is from your life, impact others. So when I make inroads into anybody's life, there are things that I know I definitely would leave. I know that I'll leave a bit of an educational impact. I know that I'll leave a bit of a spiritual impact. I know that I'll leave a bit of social skills impact. But I need to recognize that all these things are deposited in me by virtue of the God that lives in me, whose Holy Spirit makes me who I am. So in, in a nutshell, I'm a wife. I'm a very ordinary person. I'm a mother of two, as you were told. And I also do uh, 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 overt ministry. The reason why I say the word overt ministry is because being a pastor's wife means that you are part of the pulpit ministry as well as attending to people, you know, in their private lives and in their needs. I do overt ministry as a pastor's wife, but I also do what may not be very overt as in a covert ministry through my uh, status as a specialty registrar in obstetrics and gynecology. I, I, I feel that literally I do probably 70% of my ministry in that capacity. The reason is I serve the, the ministry and the purpose of my husband being a wife who is submitted unto her husband. But I also believe that God has entrusted unto our hands our own niche, our own ministry as well. And I believe that for me, that is done through the practice of medicine. I'm an author and uh, uh, a teacher. I put that in parenthesis because uh, uh, it's, it's something that is open for definition. And as I've said earlier, I'm a mentor. So if, if I... I'm looking at all these things that are available for me to engage in. It all stems from the fact that there's been an opportunity to identify why God created me. 
there's been an opportunity to identify why I am, even in the UK. At the time I'm in the UK, I was born and brought up in Ghana. Why did God provide the opportunity to come to the UK? And I want you to be asking yourself the same question. And having come to the UK and understood why I'm in the UK, I have, by the grace of God, tried to marry the understanding of what he created me to be and the opportunity he's provided me for being where I am at the moment to, you know, help me direct my actions. In other words, help me pick what should be the works of my hands. So, uh, young ladies, I'll say to you, that understanding of who and what we are is paramount, is really, really important. Because when you identify that, it eases the struggle of your focus. It eases the struggle of trying to be. When you've not identified that, we try to be a lot of different things, none of which we are able to shine at because we've not identified our niche. The second thing is prioritizing. As I bring my message to a close so that you can uh, ask questions, prioritizing. For me, it's always God, family, church. And the reason why that is so is because I believe that is the way God wants it to be. He first. My priority always being how I may reflect his life, how I may by my life bring him glory, whether it's an encounter with a patient in the consulting room, whether it's an encounter with someone in the corridor, in the street, wherever it is, how I may bring his light to shine and, and let others see that light in me. Family because that is my first church. Family because that is a responsibility that he's given me. So God, family, and then the general society or church generally. Now, how does that apply to you? You've got God first. Let your focus also be the uh, 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 things that he's committed to your hands, your studies, the relationships that he's given you. And I'm not talking of boy-girl relationship here. I'm talking of the opportunities that he provides for us to interact with others. And let your church family be part of that uh, uh, prioritization so that you do not leave the things of God because when you've left it, then you fail to reflect the light of the sun and in failing to reflect the light of the sun, you fail to shine because like the moon, we are without a light of our own. I've also learned this balancing act of retreating. So I'm prioritizing my life I'm putting God first, I'm putting family second, and I'm putting society in general. And within the context of that, I'm doing my practice of medicine. And sometimes you need to step back and take time for yourself. You need to step back and, you know, engage with the Lord. So I call it both a physical and a spiritual retreat where I'm taking time out to replenish what I've put out because you cannot give what you don't have. You cannot keep on without going back to the source of that strength. Remember that he's giving you everything that you need to make an impact in life, but you must also go repeatedly back to that source to tap in and to be uh, 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 built up again, one more to be of benefit to others. And I'm making sure that I have rest for myself as well and it's important in your medical study in the practice of your career when you have married you you are serving the needs of your husband you are serving the needs of your children please create time for yourself it's really important that you do that another thing that i do is that i aim for bite-sized achievements bite size every little counts so it, it is not uh, a life of impact only if um, you know, uh, stood in front of a, an auditorium full of 5,000 people speaking the word of God. No, that one encounter with, you know, uh, 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 an individual. I remember this year, early this year, I delivered a, a lady by cesarean section. And when she saw me, she had a very beaming, very big beaming smile on her face. And I wondered why she was so, you know, uh, excited to see me. And she told me that two years ago, you delivered my daughter and I've named her Grace. 
that was like, you know, the icing on the cake at the time. And the, 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 there wasn't a huge lot I did. I just did my job. But I made sure that I did my job excellently. And because of trying to reflect God's light in that bite-sized achievement, it's just a routine thing, doing a cesarean section, but letting God's uh, 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 graces and, and, and light be, be manifested through the way I spoke to her, the way I calmed her down, the way I generally did things with her. She left with a very good impression. She left with some sort of uh, a seed of kindness in her heart, in order, uh, which made her name her daughter Grace. And I was very, very privileged, uh, pardon me, I was very, very privileged to again do uh, the delivery of her uh, uh, baby this time as well bite size make use of every opportunity so it's not only in in you know uh authoring a book oh yay she's written a book no that's not it it's 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 not of any use if you've written a book but your one-to-one -one interaction with people leaves a sour taste in their mouth make use of every small opportunity that comes your way and to end, be grateful for the opportunity to serve. So, uh, usually, when people would ask you of, uh, for something, the, the uh, truth of the matter is they are leveraging your time and your skill. But I always make sure to go and say a massive thank you to them. And the reason why I do that is because if they hadn't provided you with the opportunity, you wouldn't have the, ch the, the chance to shine. You wouldn't have the chance to uh, reflect God's glory. And so whenever you have been given the opportunity to, to do something, after you've applied yourself and you've made sure you've done it excellently, be grateful for the opportunity. Do not look at it as an inconvenience. Do not, for me, nothing is too small. Nothing is too big. I love that opportunity to, to be of service to, to somebody in whatever capacity. So when a, a patient's partner says to me, could we have a jug of water, please? Even though I'm there in my capacity as a specialty registrar, uh, standing in to provide their medical care, it's not beneath me at all to go and fetch them a jug of uh, water. And then they say, thank you. And I thank them for asking me to go and fetch water for them. And it might seem strange, but every opportunity given us to shine in a way to demonstrate God-like qualities is an opportunity that we should be grateful for. So I hope that in a way, I've managed to weave my life story into these techniques that I've shared with you to help you understand how you can balance being who God has called you to be with, you know, your, your life in general, your, your career and, and your family life and everything else that God would grant you opportunity to find your hands to me. And now I'll pause and I'll take questions. God richly bless you. Amen. 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 Mavis, I thought you were directing. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mommy, Dr. And Mrs. Grace. God bless you. Amen. Okay. So please, question time. Please, you can just, uh, if you have a question, you can just put it on the chat room. Or you can send it to me personally, if you don't want others to know your question. Or you can send to me as well, whichever is easiest. You see, Dr. Grace has spoken and has told us a lot, and I know many of you have questions about what next okay please there's a question how do we make sure we don't lose ourselves in the process of serving others that is such a great question and sometimes uh there's something that i call a giver's fatigue where you give and give and give and give of yourself to others and you feel bent out 
And that is why there's a need to retreat both physically and spiritually, making time for yourself. Keep your focus on what it is that God wants you to do. But remember that when you have a tired vehicle or body, the Holy Spirit cannot even effectually use you. And so it's really important that you take time out to rest and to replenish the graces that are upon your life. So retreat physically and spiritually. The second thing you need to understand is that you cannot please everybody. Mm-hmm. So let me just break it down. Now, I'm a burgundy lip color wearing us of mommy. I can't put in everywhere. <laughs> you get me? There are some that look at my very, you know, red lip color. My husband jokes that when we are being transferred for our, from our district, the district women's leadership will say, oh, her mommy, she's so good. When she's coming, you can see her red lips. So <laughs> that is his way of teasing me. But for me, it's real. The, the, the fact of my appearance alone would mean that it's not everybody that I can be a blessing to. Mm. Do we understand that? So we need to also understand that if we are trying to be a blessing to every Tom, Dick and Harry under the sun, we will lose ourselves. Because eventually, instead of serving God's purpose, what we would be trying to do would be to please everybody. So note that it is important that you allow God to also help you identify your niche of influence. You are not sent onto everybody, but you are sent onto somebody. Mm -hmm. So identify that opportunity and make use of it. And in the process, do not forget yourself. Retreat physically and retreat spiritually. Thank you. God bless you. Please. I'm still waiting for questions. There's one, here. There's one okay. on the chat. It says, please, is there a need to get close to family to understand you in a case where they feel you're overly ambitious? So um, uh, to understand this question, is in it when your family, members think you're overly ambitious? Your own family members. Mm. It, it, it is not an unusual thing. I'll share a little bit of my story. So um, uh, one, the third of four siblings, the third of four siblings, and before me, no one in my family had gone to medical school. From what my mom tells me, woke up one day, four years old, and declared that I'm going to be a doctor. And I'm an only girl too. I have three brothers. Now, I come from Ghana, uh, within the Ashanti region, and in the Akan culture, is a female that perpetrates the family line. And so people could not understand why I would want to study and study and study uh, uh, in our local parlance, translating it literally means why? Do you want to be so educated you go and write on God's tongue? <laughs> that is what I used to get told because people did not understand why. But I want to encourage you that When you have resistance in terms of your ambition from your own family, make yourself useful. Let that ambition serve them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, those of my aunties, my uncles, you know, the members of my mom's church, uh, my mom and dad's church, who thought, you know, she's a little too much, she's not going to find any husband to marry, are being served by the very ambition that they had issues with i get calls you know about health issues that i think should be dealt with even at their you know local level but i still get calls about it so one of the things that you can do is to keep on demonstrating humility so that they understand that ambition is not the equivalent of pride once you keep on demonstrating that and serving them they would come to appreciate the gifts that I knew. It might be a, a long battle, but eventually they will. Eventually they would come to appreciate the, the ambition that you have. And don't give up on that ambition because that same ambition that they have a problem with will serve them in the future. I can say that with an emphatic yes, it will serve the family. Because of that ambition that I had, now I've got two Uh, 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 younger cousins who are pursuing medicine. I've got one that is uh, uh, 
finished her doctorate in pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And I believe that someone had to pay the way. My mom is a retired uh, primary school teacher. My dad is what you would call a fitter in Ghanaian plans. That's a mechanic. So sort of uh, 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 an apprentice engineer, if I can put it that way, learned the trade on the job, never went to any formal school. So where did that, you know, desire to become a medic and to be excellent at what I do? Where did it come from? God gave you that ambition. So they would appreciate it eventually. But your job is to make sure that you keep on demonstrating humility so that they do not mistake ambition for pride. Mm -hmm. Okay, mommy. Mommy, please, there's another question here. How do you know you are tired and need a retreat? Is it when you get so tired of giving? <laughs> I think the person has answered their own question, isn't it? <laughs> when you are bent out, you know. Your body tells you, your brain tells you. So I, I sometimes would come home tired and it's bodily tiredness because... Uh, obstetrics and gynecology is such a physical job. You, you, you are always up and doing. So I'm tired, but my brain is alert. And there are times when I'm not just bodily tired, I'm also mentally tired. And there are times when I'm not just bodily and mentally tired, I'm also emotionally tired. I'm psychologically tired. And I'm sensing a, 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 a distancing or, or a, a gap between me and God, the closeness that I feel with him usually, I'm not sensing it. That is my uh, cue that I need a retreat. So if it's just physical tiredness that I have, then I need to find some sleep time. If it's mental tiredness, I need to take some downtime, do something that does not actively engage my mind. So I like watching soups. So I watch soups. <laughs> And I watch, you know, and a lot of fluffy stuff, as I put it. It doesn't require any intellect. I'm just watching. Sometimes I read, but I don't read serious stuff when I'm mentally tired. I just read storybooks. And then, dependent on whether I'm sensing a spiritual, you know, uh, downtime in me or not, as in I feel drained of virtue, if I can put it that way, then I'll take a retreat. So sometimes I set myself up to fast every Friday because Fridays are the days when I'm not at work. So then I can do a fast. I don't believe in fasting or not being able to pray. So I prefer to fast when I'm at home so that I can at least pray. And I think you know yourself well. So when you see those, you know, signs and symptoms, you know, it's time to take a retreat. Okay. Okay. Please, there's another one. How do you identify your purpose? Okay. So... There are things that would come very easy to you. That is a clue of your purpose in life. So, for instance, when, when you decided to do medicine, what was it that made you want to do medicine? Where did that, you know, yearning to, to help others come from? That is a, a key to what your purpose is. There are things that would upset you greatly. That is also a key to what your purpose is. So when, when you see, you know, uh, 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 people receiving uh, health care that is uh, mediocre, that is bringing out a reaction in you, wanting to, you know, provide them with something better, a, be a better alternative. That is a key to identifying your purpose. There are things that you do not, you know, learn by way of, uh, education or practice, but they come to you. It's a natural talent in you. You are a great dancer. Is is your purpose perhaps to communicate God through your dance act? So I know that a uh, 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 group of people are very specific. We are, you know, medics or accountants or you know pharmacists. So we are a very specific group. But there are diverse ways of identifying that. And you will find that also there are things that bring you immense joy at doing. That is also a key to your purpose. So there are at least four keys that I've shared. The things that bring you joy, 
the things that you find very easy to do, the things that really affect you when it's not done to the uh, uh, standard that you expect it uh, to be, and the things that naturally are talents that you exhibit. And the way to make sure that these are not just your feelings and you know your desires coming in, but that which God has planned for you, seek his face and let him confirm it for you. So that to me is the way of identifying your purpose. Remember that there is one ultimate purpose that God has for us. And that is that we should be fruitful, we should multiply, we should make of the God kind on earth. The other aspect of it is the vehicle through which God would enable us to do that, you know, first line assignment that he's given us. And he is always willing to show us exactly what it is that he wants us to do. Thank you. Another question quickly. How would you advise young ladies who, I think one of our sisters asked the question about how do you get close family members to understand when they are complaining that you're you're too ambitious. One of the things that family members can say to young ladies who are ambitious, they want to study to a higher level or they want to start their own business and be financially independent is if you do that, you won't get a husband because (laughs) men will think that you're too you're way above them so you will not get a husband and and that is a a concern i had a conversation with a a lady a while back who whose parents were not just they were not really concerned that she's ambitious they were just concerned that her advanced studies means getting a husband would be a problem or by the time she's finished she'll be too old to find a husband to have kids so can you advise on that please i i share very much in that experience So one of the things that um, um, family members and church members and general community members were worried about was that going uh, for a higher education would mean that uh, I would engage in sexual promiscuity, I'll fall pregnant, and then I'll terminate the pregnancy. And so when I eventually uh, got married, if I got married, I wouldn't be able to have children. The second thing was that I would become too high and mighty uh, to allow any man to approach me to ask for my hand in marriage. And the third thing was that I would be too old by the end of my studies to be able to even find an age appropriate husband to marry at the time. So if it's any consolation to you, God's word in Jeremiah 29, 11, is put on. He knows the plans he has for you. They are for your good. They are not to harm you. And he will bring you to that expected end. For me, it's so important. That expected end is not an end. He says he will bring you to that expected end. So when uh, uh, family members are concerned about you being too, you know, educated to allow men to come and uh, uh, propose to you, do a self-check. My mom has this proverb that she says that if uh, I'm literally translating it, so bear with me, if I uh, am sensitive to my own body odor, nobody would accuse me of body odor. Does that make sense to anybody? So basically she's asking me, for lack of a better way, to sniff at myself discreetly so that if I'm putting off any bad bill, I can sort it out before anybody notices it. And it's helped me a lot. It's not literally for body order. It's an application of life. So basically, if there is a question as to your suitability for marriage because of higher education, do a quick self-check. Am I exhibiting signs of haughtiness? You know, some of us, when the young men approach us, the way we look them up and down, and then sometimes, you know, we'll give them a sizing up with our hands. Someone else is observing. And then the minute they also want to go for it, someone else wants to come for it. A third party is going to pull them and say, hey, that's Grace. Please don't go there. She is going to give you like a good, you know, dressing down because she thinks you are not her class. So do a quick self-check. If you are exhibiting signs of haughtiness, please sort it out discreetly. Don't let anyone be aware of your body order. Remember that, a quiet and a gentle spirit is what God expects of us. 
then if you've done your check and you are not, you know, being high and mighty, but you are exhibiting humility, then trust that God will bring you your money. And honestly, any man that is threatened by your high education, that is threatened by your debility, which is one of my special words, that is your status in life, any man that is threatened by that is not the man for you. Because God will bring you a man whose purpose, your qualifications, your uh, attributes, your virtues will serve. God, you see, God is a businessman. He does not invest in, excuse my words, rubbish. He does not, you know, give good quality seed to bad land. He does not do that. Mm -hmm. And so he is giving you the opportunity. He's giving you the brains to assimilate information. He's giving you, you know, that opportunity to study. He's going to bring a man your way who, when, when I, I met my husband, you see, I come from Ghana, so most of my, you know, uh, uh, stories would be my Ghanaian experience. In Ghana, when you're a medic, it's like you are a second god. Oh, doctor. Oh, doctor. And I don't see myself at all like that. Doctor, so what? It's, it's something you do. That is my take on it. And a lot of the guys that I came into contact with had that sort of, you know, same attitude. So even when you are stating something normally, they, they choose to take offense. Like, you know, you are being too known because you're educated. You want to put it out there because your English is good. You want to, you know. Then I met my husband. The man doesn't even know I'm a doctor, you see. He can't be bothered. You are his wife, period. So why? Because he's secure in himself and in who he is. And I want to assure you that God will bring your way that kind of man. Who is secure? He, he would even fire you up to achieve more. Because after all, when you are in certain positions, your financial security is greater. When you are in certain positions, where you are able to meander into is wider. Who does it serve? It serves him. It serves his children. It serves his progress. A wise and smart man would recognize that. So please, when family people are worried about that, assure them, as my mom will say, my day inside, God will bring it. That is, God has a specific man for me. He will bring that man to me. So I want to encourage you not to be afraid. Please don't let go of your ambition because of marriage. Whatever it takes, God will bring you your man. So long as it is his will for you to marry, your education will not stop it. Mm -hmm. But make sure you do that self-check. Don't be haughty. Don't think you are above any man. If anything at all, look at it this way. If he's not, you know, as grand as you would want, it's your opportunity to beef him up, set him up, make him the grand man that you are looking for. So long as it's God's will, of course, please pray. I'm not just talking of statuses in life. I hope I've answered your question. Any more questions? Not so far from my end. Okay, someone said, uh, let me see. Uh, right, so if we have no more questions then, Dr. Grace, um, I had a message to for you to kind of tell them how to order the book. So if you can maybe give give a bit of information on that. Okay, so um, the book is available on Amazon. Uh, the title is Can God Interrupt Your Life? I don't know if we can all see it. Mm, yes. Not too well. I'm a bit far from my camera. Can we see? Yes, can please. Can God Interrupt Your Life? So yes, you can search for it on Amazon, either by the title or by my name, mm -hmm. and it should come up. And it's available in two formats. It's available in the paperback, or in the electronic version on, on uh, Amazon Kindle. So you can order from there. The second thing is I have a website. It's called simplygraced.co.uk. So the word simply, the word grace with a D, graced.co.uk. And when you go to that website, you can also order the book from there. 
and it will be uh, sent to you. The third thing is in the pipeline. Um, uh, at the moment, in the process of doing the audio version. So you can listen to it. You don't have to read it. You can listen to it. And uh, uh, when that is available, that means then that it can be purchased on Audible or it can be purchased on the website as well. So those are the modalities. Uh, alternatively, if you find going to the website difficult and so on, you can uh, private message me. I'm happy for Mama Rose to give my contact number out. I'm always happy to be contacted. I've got some friends amongst you. Uh, so uh, they've kept in touch since 2019 when I came to Ukraine. And it's been a great, great pleasure, uh, you know, uh, communicating with them. So I would like to make more friends. Uh, I, I like to keep young in mind and, heart, and the only way to do that is through association with the young. So you can private message me and I can see how that can be sorted out for you as well. So any more questions? Going once, twice? Gone. Gone. <laughs> 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 God bless you so much. It's always a privilege um, to hear from you. And tonight we've been blessed. And I'm sure the ladies and the gentlemen on, on, on the line will testify that you've opened our eyes to so many things. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Holiness unto, unto the Lord. Lord. Amen. 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 I have been. I've been so blessed uh, by this wonderful program. I've been so blessed by our mother today, uh, you know, and everything I've learned here is things that I can reflect on as a young, uh, as a young uh, adult. And it's things that I know I can be able to emulate in my life now. And not only now, but I can also be able to emulate in the future. Uh, so I'm really, really blessed. And I believe everybody else here is blessed. Uh, so on behalf of the Church of Pentecost and also the Ladies Ministry, I would love to give a very great and big thanksgiving uh, to our mother, Dr. Mrs. Grace Asante Dua. Uh, may God bless you so, so much. May God increase you. Uh, may God enlarge your territory so that you can inspire and motivate even many more community and many, many more generations. Uh, may God replenish you. May he restore you. Uh, may God bless you so much abundantly. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, so thank you so much, Ma. And uh, I would also love to give thanksgiving to everybody that made time to join. Uh, the time is not so convenient in Ukraine, but however you guys, you sacrifice your time, you sacrifice your, your, your whatever you, 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 maybe your sleep or your studies uh, to come and gather here with us. So may God bless all of you for sacrificing your time and for joining this service, I, I have I have no shadow of doubt that we all have been blessed. And this blessing is a blessing that will not only carry us on uh, in this in this moment, but it will also uh, uh, be passed on to our future generations. So may God bless all of you guys so, so much. And once again, thank you so, so much to everyone. May God bless all of you. Amen. 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 Is that